Hello, recruit, and welcome back to the M00M Resistance. You are now listening to M00M Theater on the Air. I'm your host, Geographic, and this is Episode 3, Chapter 3, The Departure, Part 2. Kevin's container was a mess, dark and dreary. If a stranger was tasked with finding something, it would be nearly impossible. But beyond all the clutter, pots and pans and canned rations was a metal cabinet. As he opened it, its level of organization and care was quite the opposite of the rest of his container, a storage compartment of great pride. Photos of his family, artwork he had framed, a fairly impressive amount of ammunition, several weapons, and most important of all, his longshoreman jumpsuit, untouched, perfectly preserved. He slipped it on and suited up, and within the same motion, sprint away towards the control tower. The rows and walls of shipping containers surrounded him as they converged into a solid blur of streaking light as he focused on reaching his target. He slid to a halt near the entrance of the control tower, stopping dead in his tracks. He realized that their plan might have suffered from a critical oversight. There were scanners made to detect clarity chips, and without chip access to the building, Entry was restricted. Gold, do you copy? Guff Gold? The entrance door uses clarity to unlock. They used to use a key card, but not anymore. That thing is going to scan me, see that I'm unchipped, and the whole spot is going to be crawling with alphabetics. His voice let on that the plan may have already failed. What are the odds that the door still has a card reader? Over. Goldstar asked. Kevin quickly whipped his head back around the corner to confirm. I mean, I think so, but the odds of it still working? Mm. Over. Do you still have your card? If you do, you know what I'm going to say, right? He stuck his hand in his pocket, the pocket where he always used to store his key card. He pulled it out, revealing a worn-down image featuring a younger him. I honestly still can't believe I got this thing. He muttered to himself, and then announced out loud, Oh, fuck it. If this don't work, we dead anyway. Without further hesitation, he ran to the door as fast as he could to avoid the overhead scanner. And in a coordinated motion like butter to bread, he slid his card into the card reader, and to his absolute surprise, the door opened without issue, revealing his old workplace. Just past the entryway was the current crane operator, a position he once held. A heavier set gentleman, nearly double his age, in clothing even more tattered and weathered than his own jumpsuit. Fate obviously didn't invest much into this operation. It hadn't changed one bit. The crane operator looked Kevin dead in the eyes and stared him down for 15 solid, suspenseful seconds. Then he opened his mouth to speak and spoke slowly as if he was out of touch, out of practice. Hey, guy, I'm linking with you with mine link, talking to you. You gonna make me use my real mouth? I don't recognize you. What are you doing here? Kevin's improv was under test, and in a friendly, superimposed professional manner, he replied, Oh, hey, bud. The name's Sean. I was sent over from logistics to give you an urgent adjustment to your pickup and drop-off manifest. He lied calmly. I've never seen you before, buddy. I'm not changing a manifest. You know the protocol has to be input within mind's eye. I can't even confirm your identity. Why can't I see you on MindLink? Why isn't it responding? You know the rule. All the manifest adjustments must go through MindLink and are confirmed via Fate blockchain, fumbled the crane operator. That's a good question. I've I've been trying to connect with you, but the damn thing's been giving me trouble all day. But look, brother, go ahead and MindLink with your supervisor. He can confirm it. Kevin bluffed. I don't feel like linking or talking with that prick right now. Every time I do, it's the same old story. Mike, you're not working hard enough. Mike, hurry up on your lunch break. Insect protein doesn't take that long to eat, Mike. Mike this, Mike that. You know what? Just transfer me the new manifest like you're supposed to, and I'll get it done. Kevin tapped frantically on his fake clarity chip with his pointer finger, putting on a bit of a show. Mike, this thing's really just not working right today. I can't transfer the manifest even though I see it right here in my mind's eye. Look, bud, my shift's up in 10. Just get it fixed for next time. I'll let it slide and do you this one as a favor. What's the container number and destination port or city? He conceded. The container number is 1328 and the destination is, um, Florida. Neither Kevin nor Goldstar had thought far enough ahead about where they actually wanted to go. Neither of them truly expected this crazy idea to work out. 
You feeling okay, bud? Florida. That ship must really be damaged. Florida was the name of a state. Ain't no such thing as states. If I didn't know any better, I'd almost say you're a bit suspicious and that I should report you. Speaking the name of a state is a clear violation of Fate One World Code. Kevin slid his arm into his jacket, palming a gun. Sorry, it's been a really long day with my chip malfunctioning. I can't even remember the new name for the territories we used to call states. Aw, oh, bud, hold on. Now you've done it. Within the crane operator's mind-eye user interface, a red flag popped up, featuring an error-like sound effect that indicated he had just been fined 35 fate coin. The reference reason for the infraction was listed as unlawful speech of previous territory. It also had a prompt stating, if you believe this infraction was an error, please file a dispute. Mike blinked a few times and then submitted the dispute within the augmented mind's eye interface. For the record, the place is called Fate-27A. Good thing your chip's busted or you'd have just been fine too. Be sure to pack some bug spray. I hear they have flying roaches, the crane operator Mike said as he altered the shipping manifest by physically punching in a series of codes on the old LED monitor attached to his desk. Oh, I don't need bug spray. I'm not going. It's just a bunch of oranges in that container. Urgent, extremely urgent oranges, fumbled Kev. Well, that sand's going back to the beach. It loads out now. You have a nice night, buddy. Oh, also, I did you a favor and reported your glitchy chip. They're going to send a vision officer down to help you sort that right now. Told me he's just around the corner and will be here in a moment. Oh, you're too kind, man. That's great. I'm just going to um, I'm gonna wait outside. Is that cool? Suit yourself, replied the crane operator. He calmly made his way to the door and then immediately started running back to Gold Star. Mid-sprint, he could already see container 1328 suspended from the air as it hovered in place directly above its original position. He missed his opportunity. Mission halfway accomplished. However, he ended up stopping and perching against the container wall to catch his breath, and then decided to go back to his own container to collect his belongings. Fate agents had positioned themselves immediately below Gold Star's previous container position, and were transfixed and glued to their scanners. They didn't seem to know the exact container that had consumed their colleagues. I, I think the container in question is that one right there, declared one of the agents. Yeah, that's the one. I recognize it from the transmission. Scan it. The agents began scanning Kevin's container, mistaking it for Gold Star's. Their instruments revealed no interesting readings. A lurching sound of grinding metal overhead echoed across the court. The crane was the puppet master as it swung her across the yard. Gold Star was in motion. Set a charge and detonate it. We need that container open. I know they must be in there. The agents attached an explosive charge to the door and detonated it as container 1328 continued its way across the port cityscape of containers undetected. Sir, no trace of mycelium compound or our crew, but we found some art, books, and a bed. Looks like that shipless illegal was living here, explained one of the agents. Burn the art, burn the books, burn everything inside. That creature could be anywhere. Keep your eyes open, Agent Q ordered as Agent C watched his transmission via clarity. A bonfire-like blaze was seen from Kevin's perspective as a flamethrower weapon was used to torch the only remaining elements of his previous life. Oh, Star, you copy? Just let me know how I'm supposed to get out of here because they just torched my whole spot and y'all in the air now. You're not, said a Fate agent who had snuck up behind him and broadcast a fully rendered image of his face back to Fate. Now stay put or I'll deactivate you the agent ordered, while simultaneously making a critical error. The agent's first thought was to utilize clarity to deactivate Kevin's motor functions. Deactivation was the modern way of making an arrest. Instead of policing people and fussing about with cop cars and jails, agents could simply look at the suspect and quickly authorize a motor function deactivation, which in normal circumstances would cause the suspect's body to fully freeze. Like I said, freeze or I'll deactivate you. Nah. Kevin replied. You lose. He slid his hand into the side zip of his jumpsuit, and as the agent utilized clarity to deactivate him, Kevin drew his gun and shot the agent clear in the forehead. The agent's fatal mistake had cost him his life. Within the same millisecond that the bullet had left the chamber, a vine-like rope of glowing blue and pink had snapped down from the sky, slingshotting Kevin off the ground and 
propelling him up onto the top of the shipping container as it continued its journey across the port. Covered in goo, but unfazed due to adrenaline, he saw Agent Q and several others in the distance surrounding his previous position, tending to the dead body of their colleague. 